out here in just a second. Somebody's been messing with me. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. But did did y'all get soaked up on football yesterday? Yeah. I, uh, I was telling somebody earlier, I can't watch them games. It just drives me nuts. I get all excited. I, I, I get worn out as much as if I watch, was out there playing myself. So I went and watched the truck. I've done my piece to try to get some rain or snow going, all right? Uh, and it looks like maybe tomorrow we'll get it. So we'll see whether that worked out or not. I uh, announcements this morning. I wanted to point out. Industry Community Church, who also have disaffiliated from the Methodist Church and are now their own church, are having a soup supper the evening of January 14th from 5 to 7. And so if you want to go up there, it's free will donation. We've been there several times. It's, they put on some really good desserts, by the way, when you do their thing. I'm a dessert fan, and that's her. So kind of put that on your calendar if you're interested at all and support them that way it's on the 14th, the evening of the 14th. Jean and I, once again, would like to offer if anybody's interested in a Bible reading plan, the way we do it at our, at our house, which is we divide it up in the Bibles in four sections, history, gospel, uh, letters, and uh, poetry, and, and so forth done for a whole year. When you do it using this plan, you're done by December 16th, and you only have one reading on the weekend. We're hoping you do the other day here in church, all right? So if you'd like to have one of these to do, you've got them back there? Yeah, I already given them out five copies. Oh, all right. So they're back there on the table as well. If you haven't already got one and be interested, we recommend, she looked at it and she said, this would be our, your fourth year. I've been doing it considerably longer than that. But she said, this is her fourth year. She's kind of excited. She's actually read through the Bible three full times and she knows she's done it. And, you know, if you follow a plan like that, it works. Now, I will say this. I'm going to tell on her just a little bit. She has been known to get three or four days behind. And <laughs> have to do some catch up. But it, you can catch up and be right on it. Yeah, she says she doesn't recommend that. It makes that catch up really hard, by the way. But one thing we like about this kind of plan is you don't get wrapped around the axle in Leviticus. <coughs> to where, oh my gosh, that's, this goes on forever. You get to read some of Luke or something as well as reading in Leviticus, which is very helpful. It spreads it out a little bit. But I wanted to bring that up to you. The other thing I want to bring up is on the back of your bullet, you'll notice that there are ministry opportunities. Uh, we're needing to have some people step up and do a few things. We've got uh, Nathan back there doing part of our uh, AV stuff back there right now. We'd like to get him wound in there a little farther. But he isn't the one who'd be posting things. If we want to post this stuff online like we've been doing, I need someone to step up and be willing to do that. If you're interested in some of those kind of ministries that are listed there, uh, especially like that one, to help with Nathan on that part, he can get the recording done, but he isn't going to be posting. So if we want that ministry to continue, we need to have somebody step forward and be willing to take that part and be in charge of our Facebook page. Uh, we need to get somebody on there as administrator to keep it up. So if there's something that you're interested in or you'd like to try doing, give us a chance. Give, a, give me a call. And I'll put you in touch with whoever can bring you up to speed for doing it, okay? And so keep those in mind. Do note, next Sunday is Gene's and my last Sunday here. And we're going to undecorate the church and then have us a good meal afterwards and laugh at each other about how the last three years have been. Alright? 
So be ready to, to uh, join us for that. It'll be a fun time as well as uh, hopefully a, a good time of ministry as well. Is there anything else that anyone would like me to bring forth before the church family this morning? Since you showed me how to do it, I'll do that. But I'm going to break it first. Well, I've got to find a button here. All right. I'm not used to that working up there. That's a new thing this year. Anything else? And if you bow your heads for an opening prayer, God, it's such a lovely morning this morning. We thank you for that. And thank you for letting us to be here this morning to worship you. Be with us in this worship, we pray. Guide our thoughts and our lives and our spirits this morning. Heal and restore us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. First hymn of this morning is Once in David's Royal City, hymn number 250. If you'll stand if you're able and join in singing, we're going to sing verses 1 through 3, then we'll greet our neighbors and then sing the last verse. <laughs> Let us confess our sins together. 
We come to you this day, gracious Lord, exhausted from all the activities of the season. It seems that we spend so much energy, time, and resources in preparation, and then when it's over, we collapse. We wonder what happened to all the enthusiasm we had. Lord, forgive us for placing our energies in getting and gathering. Give us peace and strength to renew our commitment to you. Remind us again to look around at the many ways in which we can be of service to you by reaching out to our community. Help us move forward in our compassion and not collapse in our witness. Heal us, merciful Lord, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Though the world swirls around you and exhaustion threatens to overtake you, rest your spirits in the great God of all creation, who is with you now and forever. Friends, believe this good news of the Bible. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. of those blessings. 
Lord, help us to say with the psalmist, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, I fall down in awe. We who know your name put our trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Long ago, pagan Gentiles from the east were rewarded in their search for you when they saw the glory of God in the face of the Christ child. So help us, holy God, to also keep looking for you. Help us to see Jesus. Help us to know your heart and to have your heart as we encounter Jesus. Help us to share the light of Christ in a world full of lost people, good people, who are looking for you in all kinds of ways and places and need just a little help figuring out that Jesus Christ is the one they are actually looking for. We bring to you now the troubled people and concerns that weigh heavy on our hearts, those that are ill or in pain and are depressed. Father, we pray for your healing touch. And for those who are alone and struggling with worry and fear, grant them the comfort of your presence. And those that are lost, that they might find you. Father, we continue to pray for our nation in this troubled world that seems so out of control. Bring us all to your throne of grace. Help us to place our trust and our lives in your care and give us strength and courage for the times that are ahead. Let your love be the foundation from which all of our actions spring, Lord. And Father, we do lift, offer these prayers in the precious name of Jesus, who was and is and ever will be the only Savior of the world. Amen. The praise hymn this morning is Trust and Obey, hymn number 467, and you may remain seated for singing this.
Now, trusting and obeying are, are hard things to do, but obedience actually builds on the trust. If you'll trust him, you'll find that you're able to obey. It's kind of a building thing. One is necessary, the other. It's also, it's kind of like friendship is based on trust as well. If you don't have trust, you don't have friendship. In the same way with obedience, out of the trust, you can have obedience to someone that you truly trust. It's now time when we offer up a prayer this morning for the offering that has been placed in the plate at the back. So if you'll bow your heads for a moment of prayer. Father, we are grateful, grateful for the generosity aroused in us by Christ coming into the world in this season that we have just celebrated. May these gifts represent a new spirit of joyous sharing among us for the sake of all your children everywhere. Amen. And now it's time for Vivian's choice. So what do we have, Vivian? 221. Number 221. In the bleak midwinter. In the bleak midwinter. Number 221 may remain seated. Joseph in a dream and said, 
Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night, and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem, and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted, because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. There's a couple things in there before I start the sermon I want you to note, though. One of the things is this Archelaus, who was uh, reigning in uh, Galilee, in that area of Judah. According to history, he was so bad and so vicious that even Rome removed him after six years as being a, a king or governor over that area. He placed a Roman governor in his stead because he was so vicious. I, I thought that was very interesting and something we don't normally think about. But if he, if as, as vicious as the Romans were, and he was even too vicious for them. So uh, that was a pretty good warning that Joseph got about not going back there. Obedience matters. Dear Lord, I thank you. Thank you for letting me be here this morning to be in worship, to share a message that I truly hope is from you. And may those that hear this message hear what you would have them, have them take from it and act on that message. For it's in your Son's name I pray it. Amen. Have you ever been told to go sleep on it when you were struggling with what to do about something? Gene has told me that quite a few times over the years. I can't tell you how often I've had in answers to things that I've been trying to figure out come to me as I wake up from a night's sleep. And she knows this about me, so I get that told to just, well, just go to bed and you know, come to you in the morning. For me, dreams are very definitely connected to my waking life. Sometimes, as I've mentioned here, they provide me with answers to real life issues. And sometimes they get troubled, and I have a hard time sleeping when I, uh, if I'm experiencing something that's particularly hard before I go to bed. You know, uh, some kind of a heavy movie with an emotional background, which drives Jean crazy. She likes those kind of movies, and I won't hardly ever watch them in the evening because I just can't sleep if I do it. Or if I'm reading a disturbing article somewhere that gets me upset, and then I can't sleep. But good grief. To be honest, if I watch CNN, that's all it takes for me to have a bad night. <laughs> a bruised night's sleep. But folks, I can't remember ever having an angel show up in a dream and warn me about imminent danger to either myself or my family. But four times in the gospel, to, in the message today, Joseph had specific men warnings through a dream. At Matthew 20, by the appearance of an angel in a dream, God told Joseph to go ahead and take Mary as his wife. And in today's text, Joseph had three more dreams from God. He was told in a dream to pack up his family.
from their temporary home in Bethlehem and flee to Egypt. That was in verse 13. Then in verse 19, God told him that it was time to return to the land of Israel. And then in the fourth dream, Joseph was warned about Herod's son. So they settled in Nazareth of Galilee. He wasn't commanded to move to, to Nazareth. If you remember reading that, that isn't what it says. But it did result, that movement in that, from that morning. All four of these messages he received from God through dreams. But they were obviously very compelling in their content. Why do I say that? Well, if I had a dream about swimming in a beach in the South Pacific, I wouldn't wake up, grab Jean, run off and leave everything I had and move us to Tahiti over it. I'd probably just kind of try to shake it off and go back to bed. Hope I could dream about it some more. But I sure wouldn't go after it. Generally, that's the way I act about most things on that kind of stuff. Even on those bad dreams I have after I watch CNN. But look at his response today. Normally, it's in the Gospel of Mark that you hear some, such immediate type of reaction and obedience. That's where he says, and immediately they got up and did whatever. You don't see that in Matthew except in these instances where it's talking about Joseph in these dreams here. And the other thing is, if you notice, he apparently made no complaint about it, about doing so. It's kind of interesting to me that when you look at the scripture, Joseph was selected to be the adopted father of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And you know what? If you read the scriptures, think about it. He never says one word in all the scripture. Not one single word. He just does what he's told to do. No argument. None of this like Moses said, Oh God, I can't speak. Or any of the other excuses that you get from even the great icons of our faith. He just simply did what he was told to do. Uh, I'm not that good, I'll be honest with you. But he just simply obeyed right now. And this isn't just uh, whether to go to town or not. From their perspective, their whole life was totally upset based on the, the old man having a dream. A dream? And not just for a day or two, guys. We don't want to make the mistake of thinking this all happened right now, right one night after the other. Think about it. The reason we think that way, feel that way, like it was some kind of just a whirlwind and it all happens, is because we try to do our nativity scenes when we put this stuff all together. And you always have the wise men there as well. And the sheep and the shepherds and everything. And we think this all happened at one time. And then when we read the story, we always continue on and say, Oh, but then he had to go off to Egypt because Herod was trying to kill him and the babies were getting killed in Bethlehem and so forth. But think about it. She, Mary was six months pregnant when she came back from Elizabeth's house. So from the time of that first dream, when, when Joseph got that first dream, it had to have been at least three months till he was born, Jesus was born. And then it could have been up to two years after that before the, the uh, wise men showed up, the Magi. Because it would have been, we know it was several months, up to two years. That's the reason Herod picked all the babies from two years old and younger to be killed. So this would be, their life was messed up <clears throat> over two years just between those two dreams. And when you get to that fourth dream, we don't have any idea how long they were in Egypt. So if we, we get this picture of Jesus as just this little baby that's in the manger. And like I said last night, he won't stay there. Keep that in mind, because like I said last week, he, he didn't come to stay in the manger. But when they packed up to leave, he was probably crawling. He actually could have been up and walking and probably talking a little bit. <clears throat> And they've been settled there. They've got, he's got a job. Joseph does. He's working. He's supporting his family. They've got a home. 
Because if you read, the Magi showed up at the house where they were at. So they're settled in, and Joseph wakes up in the middle of the night. If you notice, it says, well, it's still dark. He's packed them up. In the middle of the night, he loads them up, takes off, and they're gone. My gosh, what kind of obedience. Just think about it. That kind of obedience for just a moment. That's almost bizarre. Wouldn't you say that's kind of bizarre? If it happened to you, Lorraine, don't you think you think, Kevin, you've been, what have you been doing? No? We wouldn't act that way. But they did. By the way, we don't see any sign of Mary complaining about it either. She went with it. Obedience to this dream that he had from God. Well, I can think of a couple things that might have caused that. Now, bear in mind, yes, they were afraid of Herod. He was a bad dude. Vicious. But it wasn't just Herod that caused this. If you remember, when you read back in, in uh, Matthew 19, when he was first being notified that Mary was uh, pregnant, and then it was from the Holy Spirit, it, the ESV says... Being a just man is how they describe him. But I've got to tell you, the NIV doesn't word it that way. The NIV words it as, was faithful to the law. And actually, that more accurately, accurately captures what the original Greek word meant and felt. You see, he was known to be obedient to the law. Everyone knew that he was going to follow the law and do what he was told to do. He didn't just follow the law. Like I said, everyone knew he followed it. He worked hard to obey all the details that God wanted done. You see, he had a personal commitment to being obedient to God. That's why he didn't pack it all up and leave as soon as he was told to. And it's also why he was able to take his family and do so as well. They knew he was going to be immediately obedient to whatever God said. And that is the kind of obedience that God wants from all of us as well. Especially for the church that's called by his name, Christian. A Christian church. You see, there comes a point where we, just like Joseph, must be committed to being obedient regardless of how bizarre it may seem to us or even to others around us, regardless as to whether we even like where it takes us, regardless of how we feel about it. It's not about feelings. It's about being committed to God. Sometimes it comes down to doing or not doing things simply because God said so. It's understanding that just as our children didn't always understand why we had them do things in particular, or at a particular time or a particular way, that we wanted them to do what they were told. Even if it was only because I told you so. How many of you said that to your kids? We've all said it. Because at some point, they have to trust you and be able to be obedient, just even if nothing else, because I told you so. And God wants that same kind of obedience from us. He doesn't want to have to explain it all necessarily to us. Sometimes being submitted to God requires that you just simply do what he tells you to do. Arguing with God or expecting God to explain the whys and wherefores of what he has told you to do. We're expecting him to convince you about an act or an attitude before you agree. Is it submitting ourselves to God? That is actually expecting God to submit himself, himself to our judgment and desires. Which, by the way, means it's actually making ourselves to be our own God. Hmm, what was it that Satan was guilty of? Wasn't it? I'll make myself even higher than God. Wasn't that what he said? And if we're going to put ourselves in a position where God must convince us of what we're supposed to be doing, 
Haven't we set ourselves up to try to be above God? That's the sin of Lucifer. That's part of what I believe is wrong with the mainline churches, many of them in the United States today. They have submitted to the culture's demands. That the culture decides what's right and wrong, rather than submitting to what God says. They have made the culture God. And if nothing else, culture will redefine what the words mean that we read and agree to. So that when we agree to what they're saying, it sounds right. Or actually, it doesn't mean what God said it meant. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Regardless of what anybody in any church or any other organization might say. And there is salvation in no other name but Jesus. It teaches us that obedience to God and obedience to Jesus is the same thing because they are one. And that if we love our neighbors, we're to love our neighbors as ourselves. And that that love is not some emotional feel-good notion, but actually putting the good and the welfare of our neighbor ahead of our own desires. Not putting what the neighbor wants ahead of our own desires, but their good and their welfare ahead of what our own desires are. And then acting on that commitment. But obedience isn't just about following those rules. It's also about our attitude. If we love God, then it will matter to us whether God approves of what we do. So let's look at it from God's side. Let's, uh, we're doing this to please the Lord. Not because He commanded us to, but because we know that's what He wants us to do. If as a parent, we tell Junior to go gather the trash and take it out for pickup, and Junior, uh, junior says, no, are we happy with him? Or how about if he gathers all the trash from home and puts it in a barrel and then leaves the barrel sitting there beside the house because he says, hey, you didn't really mean for me to have to go out into the sun and take it out to the road, did you? Will that make me pleased? Or how about Susie? If you tell her to gather up all the trash and take it out, she just gathers up what's in the kitchen because, oh, surely you didn't mean all the trash in the house. Would that make you pleased when that happens? Well, what about if she said no, but she changed her mind then and went ahead and gathered it all up and took it to the road? Would that please you? You know, Jesus actually had a teaching about this principle. If you read the parable of the two sons of Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 and 31, read it when you get a chance. It's very instructive about what obedience to God is about and what He expects. You see, obedience matters. It matters to us. And it matters to God. My prayer is that each of us would be truly obedient to the biblical principles that we have learned. I pray that this church would continue to strive to be an obedient church. A church obedient to our Lord Jesus Christ as taught to us in the Bible. And I pray that we might commit ourselves to that level of obedience. Please join me in a closing prayer. Abba Father, we come to you at the start of another year, our first new year as Enterprise Community Church. Guide us in our attitudes and, and our actions that we might be a faithful, loving, and obedient disciples of Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that we pray it. Amen. And we're going to have communion now. So if you give me just a moment to get things ready, and I'll we'll get started. Grace and peace to you from God, who is and who was, and who is to come. Unite us in faith and hope through the Holy Spirit, so that we may continue to be guided by your word and will through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, now and forevermore. Amen. And if you'll stand and join in singing our hymn.
Matthew records that after they had the supper, they sang a hymn and went out. So sing up and in our closing hymn of Sing We Now Christmas, which as you know is Jean's and my favorite Christmas hymn. So I want to hear you sing it, all right? Well, we must sing the whole thing. Because it's a story. You can't it's a cut short verses short out. Verses, okay. <laughs>